Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted to have you join us. We're studying a series of Sabbath School lessons, the ones just prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the months of April, May, and June of 2013. This happens to be the very last lesson in that series. It's a series talking about the minor prophets of the Old Testament. And of course, you would guess that the last lesson would be talking about Malachi. Before we jump into Malachi and see some challenging issues there, we'd like to ask you to get your Bibles and bow your heads with us as we begin. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for the many blessings that you bestow upon us. And as we consider Malachi and his comments about those who receive blessings from you, may we learn lessons from those who lived some 2,500 years ago. We want to be more like you, May this study of this lesson bring us closer to you as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> we would like to take a moment also to say that both the audio and the video of these lessons are available on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, if you choose to look at us there. Malachi. What comes to your mind when you hear the word Malachi? Maybe you have a friend by that name. It's one of the biblical names that more people are using in our time. But Malachi in the original Hebrew meant my messenger. It could be an abbreviation of even a longer name, Malachia, which means the messenger of Yahweh or the messenger of the Lord. By the way, uh, do Adventists have anybody else we know by the name the messenger of the Lord? Yeah, she said she was not a prophet but she was a messenger of the Lord. Okay. And I wonder if she really understood what, what the significance of what she said at the time. Yes. The messenger of the Lord might be even more, more significant powerful. and more powerful than, than a prophet. Yeah. Well, it turns out that the word, the term Malachi, the name, if it may be a name because it has this significance, the messenger of the Lord, it may be a title and not a name. We just don't know for sure whether this is the guy's real name or whether this is a title he had, but it's not found anywhere else in the, in, in the Bible. So this is the only, and, and there's, there's no, no information in the little book of Malachi that tells us any of his relatives, what kind of a person he was, etc. Uh, all we have is this name. We get a little bit of a clue, uh, a couple things give us a little clue about the timing of the book. He's using the Socratic method, uh, dialectical reasoning. One point of view and then there's another point of view and, and you, you, you look at, raise questions back and forth and, and Malachi is very good at that. Socrates, who lived just about the same time, loved to use this method and so it's often referred to as a Socratic method. But Socrates wasn't the first one to use it? Socrates was probably not the first one to use it. There are a couple of verses in here that will give us a clue about when the book was written. Look first at Malachi 1, verses 7 and 8. This is how, by offering worthless food on my altar, then you ask, how have we failed to respect you? I will tell you, by showing contempt for my altar. When you bring a blind or sick or lame animal to sacrifice to me, do you think there's nothing wrong with that? Try giving an animal like that to the governor. Would he be pleased with you or grant you any favors? Now the fact that it talks about a governor and not a king or someone else like that suggests that it was at a time there was governors ruling over Israel and that would mean when? It would have to be after the, after the Babylonian captivity when there was a series of governors appointed to rule over Israel, appointed of course by the emperor um, who at that time of course would be the emperor of Medo-Persia. Then if you drop down to chapter 3 and verse 10, <coughs> you'll find this comment that may help. Bring the full amount of your tithes to the temple so that there will be plenty of food there. So it suggests that was what, what was functional at the time? A temple, right? So it couldn't have been very soon after the return of, from Babylon because for the first, what, a number of years, 20 or 30 years, there was no temple available. It wasn't until Haggai and Zechariah got the people busy to build a temple. So that's why we tend to date this somewhere late 
well, the end of the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament period, probably somewhere around the year 425 um, B.C. is when we, we think this book was probably written. Um, <clears throat> he talks about many of the sins suggested by, by the book, if you read through the book, were sins that are also rampant in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. That's another clue that would put it somewhere down around 425 B.C. Well, as we know historically, what happened after Malachi? As far as prophetic books are concerned? There were no more. For how long? 400 years. 400 years, more than 400 years, 430 or 40 years, almost 450 years before there was another prophetic individual giving messages from God. The next one would be whom? John the Baptist. Oh, John the Baptist, John just prior to the time of Jesus, yeah. So the question, that, one of the questions that we need to address in looking at Malachi is, did the attitude of the people in his day or, or something he said have anything to do with that long period of silence? Why did God's voice apparently fall silent for such a long period of time? Maybe they were so perfect that they didn't need a prophet. That was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt that must have been the answer. Um, well, well, to the opposite of that is we've talked about the times when just before the Babylonian captivity and just before the northern kingdom went, went into captivity, there were so many prophets because they needed it so much. Yeah. The, con the opposite of that would be God nope. doesn't send a prophet because they don't need it. Yeah, well, that's a possibility. You know, how long... Be What's the difference between time difference between uh, Haggai and, and Nehemiah Malachi? and, and Malachi? Okay, Haggai and Zechariah helped them, helped them to build right. a temple in the years from four just... from five twenty to five sixteen B.C. Now we think Zechariah continued to prophesy maybe probably down maybe as late as four eighty or something like that. So he kept going for a while. Um, Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra returned. To Israel, well, to to Jerusalem, in the year 457 B.C., and uh, Nehemiah returned in the year 444 B.C. So, and and then he 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 ruled as governor for a period of time. Then he went back to Persia, and then he was there for a while. And then the king sent him back again. And some people think that the Malachi may have happened in between the times when when um, Nehemiah was there. But most people would put him a little while after, or maybe even during the time, the second governorship of um, Nehemiah. So that's the. Well, wasn't the that when they were starting to have what would be a revival, or? You know? Well, we're going to talk about that. So hold that question a little bit. Uh, revival. We'll, we'll talk about what that might be, might have implied. What, what, what is the core message of the book of Malachi? God has offered his blessings. Remember back at the foot of Mount Sinai, God said, I'm going to give you my instructions. And the people said three times, whatever you say, God, we will do. And what happened? Almost immediately they were disobeying him. Many years later, in the days of Jeremiah, God said, I'm not going to wait for you to make a promise. I'm going to come. I'm going to step in. I'm going to give you new hearts, right spirits, etc. Um, that was in the days of Jeremiah, which would be somewhere around the year uh, 600 B.C. Um, and what happened a long time later? Here we are, 200, almost 200 years after that. Um, God finally says, you know, I'm willing to bless you in many ways, but, but what? I expect a response from my blessings. I expect you to do something, and I'm not just pouring out my blessings without any kind of expectation in return. So Malachi says, I'll do this, you do that. I do this, you do that. You do that, I'll do this. So it's, um, it's a little. By the way, um, Would God dare to say something like that to our church today? You know, look at Revelation 3.16 just as a comparison. 
Revelation 3.16. This is in the middle of a message to a certain group called Laodicea. I think we've heard about them before, haven't we? It says in Revelation 3.16, Because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. You suppose that sounds anything at all like the message of what was going on in the days of Malachi? Ellen White has some interesting things to say about that spitting out of his mouth. Uh, this is found a book that many people are not aware of, Special Testimonies, Series B, number 2, page 20, says this, The Laodicean message must be given with earnestness and power as a message from heaven. If it be ignored, and that was, that's what seemed to be happening in the days of Malachi, if it be ignored, the Lord will certainly cast away from him those whose spiritual condition is so objectionable. Christ declares that pretentious piety is nauseating to him. And to, those, to the ones so full of self-sufficiency, he says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. Their works are opposed to the holy principles of God's word. Wow. And we know, those of us who have studied a little bit of Greek, that when it says God is going to spit us out of his mouth, it literally says vomit. He's going to vomit us out of his mouth. The word in Greek is emao, from which we get our medical term, emetic, something that causes vomiting. Well, the general outline of the book of Malachi includes eight different times when God addresses the people and their leaders, pointing out specific transgressions. Let me just mention those places very quickly. Malachi 1, 2, 6, 7, and 8, 10 through 13, 2, 13, and 14, 17, 3, 7, and 8, and 13, and 14. Eight times. Well, look at all the questions that people asked in the book of Malachi and think about why the people asked these questions. We're going to look at them in just a moment. Then explain the answers that God gave to each question or to some of them. Hmm. Here are the people's eight questions prefaced by God's statement, you ask. God says, you ask this, and then God responds. So what's their first question? Her first statement, if you will, how have you loved us? Later, a little bit later, how have you shown contempt? How have we shown contempt for your name? Three, how have we defied you or defiled you? Four, why do you not pay attention to our offerings and accept them with pleasure from our hands? Five, how have we wearied, how have we wearied him? Where is the God of justice? Six, how are we to return to you? How, are, how do we rob you? What have we said against you? In what ways are these issues still relevant to us in our postmodern world? How are we grappling with similar questions? And those, of course, are the summary questions in our adult teacher's Sabbath school Bible study guide. So those are questions that might be even relevant for us today, huh? In his message Bible, Eugene Peterson says this about the book of Malachi. Most of life is not lived in crisis, which is a good thing. Not many of us would be able to sustain a life of perpetual pain or loss or ecstasy or challenge. But crisis has this to say for it. In times of crisis, everything, absolutely everything, is important and significant. Life itself is on the line. No word is casual, no action marginal, and almost always God and our relationship with God is on the front page. But during the humdrum times, when things are, as we tend to say, normal, our interest in God is crowded to the margins of our lives and we become preoccupied with ourselves. The prophecy of Malachi is made to order for just such conditions. Malachi creates a crisis at a time when we are unaware of crisis. He wakes us up to the crisis of God during the times when the only thing we are concerned about is us. He keeps us on our toes, listening for God, waiting in anticipation for God, ready to respond to God who is always coming to us. Malachi gets in the last word of Holy Scripture in the Old Testament. The final sentence in his message is to us evoke the gigantic figures of Moses 
and Elijah. Moses to keep us rooted in what God has done and said in the past. Elijah to keep us alert to what God will do in the days ahead. By leaving us in the company of mighty Moses and fiery Elijah, Malachi considerably reduces the danger of our trivializing matters of God and the soul. So, look at the first three verses of Malachi 1. This is the message that the Lord gave Malachi to tell the people of Israel. The Lord says to his people, I have always loved you. But they reply, how have you shown your love for us? The Lord answers, Esau and Jacob were brothers, but I love Jacob and his descendants and have hated Esau and his descendants. I have devastated Esau's hill country and abandoned the land to jackals. Does that sound like something you would expect to hear from a God of love? No. No. It begs uh, what? Esau I have hated? Loved lest, I think, is what the word really means. Where would you get that conclusion? Well, you have to put it with some. Well, let's, let's, let's look at some examples. Here's, here's a perfect example, a very good example at least, of the fact that biblical words need to be understood in the biblical context. They can mean something very different than what you would get if you read straight out of Webster's Dictionary in, in modern times. Okay, look at, follow with me along here closely. Look first at Genesis 25, 23. The Lord said to her, now this is God speaking to Leah, the, the first wife of Jacob. The Lord said to, I'm sorry, this is God speaking to Rebekah, the father of, I mean the mother of, of um, Esau and Jacob. The Lord said to her, two nations are within you. You will give birth to two rival peoples. One will be stronger than the other. The older will serve the younger. Does that say he hates one and he loves the other? It doesn't. So that was the prophecy that was made. He says the older will serve the younger. In fact, the older never did really serve the younger, uh, not really in a larger sense. But pick a few other places. Look at Isaiah, for example. Uh, let's just pick thir Isaiah 34, starting with verse 5. The Lord has prepared his sword in heaven, and now it will strike Edom, those people whom he has condemned to destruction. His sword will be covered with their blood and fat, like the blood and fat of lambs and goats that are sacrificed, and it goes on. And if, if there's many, many passages, if you get our, our handout, uh, Genesis 36, 1 through 9, um, actually, we should actually look at that one. These are the descendants. Um, Actually, that's not the one I wanted to look at. Hold on just a second. Uh, well, we'll find it later. Anyway, Genesis 36, 1 to 9, Isaiah 34, 5 to 17, 63, 1 to 6, Jeremiah 49, 7 through 21, Ezekiel 25, 12 to 14, 35, 1 to 15, Amos 1, 11 and 12, Obadiah 1, 4, 1 to 14, many places, and that's just a smattering. There's many places in the Old Testament where it talks about the animosity and the, and, and the difficulties between the children of Israel and the children of, of Esau or, or Edom. Uh, it should be very clear that the descendants of Edom, of Esau, were frequent rivals and enemies of the Israelites. But how could a God of love say he hates them? Well, look at, look at these verses from the New Testament, Matthew 10, verse 37. Lo, those who love their father or mother more than me are not fit to be my disciples. Those who love their son or daughter more than me are not fit to be my disciples. Those who do not take up their cross and follow my step, in my steps are not fit to be my disciples. But now, and that, that makes it really easy, but if you read in the, one of the more traditional translations, uh, in fact, I need to get one. We really need to go to the King James. Give me just a second and we'll do that. He that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and falleth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life shall not take. So there's a comparison of father and mother. Now, give me another place. Look at Luke 14, 26. 
Those who come to me cannot be my disciples, lest they love me more than they love father and mother. But that one, if you go to the King James, says, and who, um, yeah, and if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. So what does that mean? We're really supposed to hate all of our family? We're supposed to hate ourselves? And Jim already suggested the idea. Really, what it's saying here, to love less. Unless we're willing to put Jesus as first priority in our lives, even over our own lives, over wife, husband, father, mother, unless we're willing to put God first, uh, we're not worthy of him. No, hate's a pretty strong word, though. Um, I just wonder, is that an accurate word to use for the translation, for the translator? The word, the word is the same word that's used for the regular hate. And you just have to decide in the context what it means. Mm. Yeah. Well, look at the next time where it talks about something, uh, the next accusation God makes. Look at Malachi 1, starting with verse 6. The Lord Almighty says to the priest, A son honors his father, and a servant honors his master. I am your father, why don't you honor me? I am your master, why don't you respect me? You despise me, and yet you ask, How have we despised you? This is how, by offering worthless food on my altar. Then you ask, How have we failed to respect you? I will tell you by showing contempt for my altar. When you bring a blind or sick or lame animal to sacrifice to me, do you think there's nothing wrong with that? Try giving an animal like that to the governor. We already mentioned that a moment earlier, a little bit ago. A little bit ago. Would he be pleased with you or grant you any favors? Now you priests, try asking God to be good to us. He will not answer your prayer and it will be your fault. And it goes on down. Um, so God is saying what? He's saying, you know, bring the kind of offerings I ask for. If you're, if you're just basically giving me your, your leftover stuff, I mean, what is that saying about your relationship to God? But it goes on down to, to describe what's going on there, and we need to read that, starting with verse 9. Now, you priest, try asking God to be good to us. He will not answer your prayer, and it will be your fault. The Lord Almighty says, I wish one of you would close the temple door so as to prevent you from lighting useless fires on my altar. I'm not pleased with you. I will not accept the offerings you bring. People from one end of the world to the other honor me. Everywhere they burn incense to me and offer acceptable sacrifices. All of them honor me. But you dishonor me when you say that my altar is worthless and when you offer on it food that you despise. You say, how tired we are of all this. And you turn up your nose at me. As you're offering to me, you bring a stolen animal or one that is lame or sick. Do you think I will accept that from, accept that from you? A curse on the cheat who sacrifices a worthless animal to me when he has in his flock a good animal that he promised to give me. For I am a great king and people of all nations fear me. Cursed be the cheat. What's God trying to tell us by saying those words? I read in their, in their sacrifices and their offerings they t didn't have a very high priority for that, for, for what they were doing. They were offering lame and sick mm -hmm. animals. Uh, God is not pleased with that. And God's going God's gonna to make it m even more graphic than that a little bit later. Hold yeah. on. But basically, I mean, putting it down in our time, uh, doctors can't even take care of cheating patients. I had a patient today. Um, Unfortunately, it's a patient who's dying of cancer. But all she wants to do is cover up her pain with pain medicines and pretend like it's not there. Well, if you tell them you've got to do this, you've got to do this, this is what you have to do to take care of your cancer, and they say, well, I'm not going to bother to do that, what's going to happen? They're going to die. They're not a thing. Now, you know, they might eventually die anyway. Eventually they will die anyway, but the Presumably, we could have helped them with their cancer if they had done something at the right time under the right circumstances. But if they just say, no, I'm, forget that, don't care about your advice. So basically, God is, I think, saying to us here, 
if you if you cheat me, you're just setting up to reap the results that you deserve. You know. So when he says curse, he's actually probably saying describing a, a state that they're in right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, with, and it shows it by how they're sacrificing, how they're putting the, the priority they put in God and all that, and that'll have an effect later on. What's the relationship between faith and cheating? You thought about that? Opposites. Huh. Yeah, they're, they're basically opposites. Faith means trust. Cheating is, is, is just the opposite of trust. And now, Paul tells us in the book of Acts, what? 1631 it says what to be saved we have to have one thing faith believe have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved he said Paul said to the jailer well if you're cheating what are you doing to your faith you're destroying your faith you're just literally if you're saying to God I, I don't believe what you tell me I'll just do what I feel like. I mean, that was that was the offering of Cain, wasn't it? He said, I, I'm not going to bother to give you what you asked for. I'll just give you what I feel like giving you. And what was the result? He ended up being a murderer. In a way, though, you can look at cheating as having faith in cheating, too. Yeah, it, it means... Which is... Which is um, you believe that it's going to be beneficial to you, and so you do it. Um, people who do not, who stay away from cheating, have faith that it's not going to be beneficial. Yeah. So. And, and sometimes cheats get away with it for a while. Mm -hmm. But eventually it pays its reward. Well, look at the, ne in the next section, Malachi 2, 1 to 9. The Lord Almighty says to the priests, This command is not for you. You must honor me by what you do. I'm sorry, this command is for you. You must honor me by what you do. If you will not listen to what I say, then I will bring a curse on you. I will put a curse on the things you receive for your support. God is saying, I'm going to curse the tithes and offerings that you receive for support. In fact, I have already put a curse on them because you do not take my command seriously. So what happens if you have pastors, if I dare to call them that, religious leaders who are promoting cheating? promoting, you know, just a, 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 a very lackadaisical attitude toward God. Is that what you mean by cheating today? Yeah. Well, look, go on. I will punish your children and rub your faces in the dung of the animals you sacrifice, and you will be taken out to the dung hill. That's God talking. Pretty great. I'm going to take you, priest, you pastors, and I'm going to rub your faces in the dung. Do I need to be more graphic than that? But what's really happening when he's, when he's doing that? I mean, it's... He's trying to get their attention, isn't he? It's, if, you, if you think about it, you know, winning the lottery to people is like the biggest blessing in the whole world. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the worldly look at it. But if you really look at what's happened to people when they get that money, it's turned out to be a curse for them. For many. For probably the majority. Probably a majority. Yep. And, um, and well, how can this good thing be a curse? Well, you can look into it and see. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing with God when he's doing this curse. Uh, you look into the situation and see how it would turn into a curse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Well, going on, uh, in my covenant I promise, well, verse 4, then I, you will know that I have given you this command so that my covenant with the priest, priests, the descendants of Levi, will not be broken. In my covenant I promised them life and well-being, and this is what I gave them, so that they might respect me. In those days, they did respect and fear me. They taught what was right, not what was wrong. So what's he, he saying the priests are doing now? Not doing Teaching what's wrong and not what's right, right? They lived in harmony with me. They did not only they not only did what was right themselves, but they also helped many others to stop doing evil. It is the duty of priests to teach the true knowledge of God. Now, some of us who feel like the knowledge, the truth about God, is the most important thing of all, 
like that message. People should go to them to learn my will because they are the messengers of the Lord Almighty. But now you priests have turned away from the right path. Your teaching has led many to do wrong. So I have, so you have, you have broken the covenant I made with you. So I in turn will make the people of Israel despise you because you do not obey my will. And when you teach my people, you do not treat everyone alike. That's a pretty, I mean, a pretty direct and pretty potent message. So is this what, did, did you say something about God cursing the pay that they're getting? Yeah. Is for, well, he set up the Levites, right, that they didn't have to work so that they would have more time to study God and to mm -hmm. study his character. And um, so they get paid to do that. But even though they get paid to do it, doesn't mean that they're going to do it. And they didn't do it. And mm -hmm. so the money actually became a curse because of that. Well, and, and they were, they're asking for it. They're encouraging. What, what are they doing? By accepting these blind and lame and faulty animals, what are they saying to the people? It's okay. It's okay. You don't have to follow God's rules. You don't have to follow God's instructions about bringing your offerings. Bring whatever. Isn't that what they're promoting? I mean, the, it, was the, it was the priest's job, if you go back in the books of Moses, to carefully inspect every sacrifice to make sure that it's perfect. And why does it need to be perfect? Who's it supposed to represent? Jesus. Supposed to represent the perfect Lamb of God, Jesus Christ himself. So if you bring one that's blind, lame, defective, what are you saying? We don't, we don't care about your plans. We don't care about what you're going to do for us. Anything will be. Anything is just fine, you know. Well, another thing tells you that um, when you don't bring the best one, that means it's you're, it's not that much of a priority to you. Yeah. But the whole thing is just get by, and maybe even the priests promoted it because then they wouldn't have to put the best things to God either. So it kind of lets everything in a downward spiral. Yeah. So they went the opposite way a little bit later, and reject refused animals that they said had a little defect and then they took them around and resold them resold and those same yeah. animals yeah okay well look at the next thing remember we said there were eight things now look at chapter 2 starting with verse 10 don't we all have the same father didn't the same god create us all then why do we break our promises to one another? And why do we despise the covenant that God made with our ancestors? The people of Judah have broken their promise to God and done a horrible thing in Jerusalem and all over the country. They have defiled the temple which the Lord loves. Men have married women who worship foreign gods. May the Lord remove from the community of Israel those who did this and never again let them participate in the offerings our nation brings to the Lord Almighty. Does that remind you of anything else you know about? Any other times in history where that was a problem? Many. Many. Solomon. Solomon would be number one. Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra and Ezra and Nehemiah's day had happened twice. Yeah. Well, this is another thing you do. You drown the Lord's altar with tears, weeping and wailing because he no longer accepts the offerings you bring him. You ask why he no longer accepts him? It's because he knows you have broken your promise to the wife you married when you were young. She was your partner and you have broken your promise to her. Although you promised before God that you would be faithful to her, didn't God make you one body and spirit with her? What was his purpose in this? It was that you should have children who are truly God's people. So make sure that none of you breaks his promise to his wife. I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel. I hate it when one of you does such a cruel thing to his wife. Make sure that you do not break your promise to be faithful to your wife. Well, that's a kind of a modern message, isn't it? Wow. And what was happening to the children of Israel at these different times? I mean, think of, I, I think of several times, even way back before Solomon, why did the children of Israel have to leave Canaan and go down into the land of Egypt? Something that most of us don't even think about. Who did the, the sons of Jacob marry? Canaanite women. Canaanite women. If he had left them in Canaan, what would have happened in one or two generations? 
Oh, to them. They would have just melted away into, into, into Canaanites, and there would have been no trace left of the children of Israel. So God had to take them down into Egypt, make them cursed by Egyptian standards, where the Egyptians said, okay, you stay over there, don't come close to us, and that way God somehow or other managed to keep them relatively pure. And so, then, so what should the children of uh, Israel, Jacob, have done to find wives? Well, I mean, there uh, other than converting the women. The well, local and women. that's what was supposed to happen. If you come down to the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, and they're talking about it, it says there were Israel Israelite men who their wives and their children didn't even speak the language of Israel. I mean, how can you expect them to learn the Jewish religion if they can't even speak the language of Israel? So there's again and again and again and again, you know, I don't know whether these Canaanite women were just better looking or, I mean, I don't see any reason for thinking that, but obviously this was a serious problem for, for Jewish men. But the question was, was there anybody available, anybody else available? Yeah. And, and the, the answer in my mind would have to be this. In Abraham's day, he converted enough followers, enough people from around him, that when he had to go to battle, he had 318 men who were trained warriors. Now that's not talking about all the people who were shepherds and whatever, and so that those people all were, and, and it says Abraham taught his people, his children especially, but his followers to, to worship and Ellen White spells this out in great detail, he would bring people together and teach them to worship the true God. So presumably there must have been some of those kind of people still left around, and th hopefully those would be the ones that the, that the sons of Jacob would marry, and maybe some did, we just don't know. We, we know that the, the ones that we have records of did a pretty bad job. I mean, look at what happened to Jacob and, and Benjamin and so forth, some of the, the wives they married and the problems they had with them. So, Judah, okay. Judah didn't do too well, did he? Judah did not do well. Well, it was God's original intention to, for men to learn about God from their wives and for wives to learn about God from their husbands. How often do you think that's happening today? Men tend to have characteristics of strength, determination, energy, setting for themselves high standards, Women tend to be more caring, loving, and accepting of others. In a true Christian marriage, the two partners are to learn from each other, and, and we could have added to those lists. The two partners are to learn from each other the characteristics of the other. This kind of God's ideal could never succeed with casual on and off marital affairs, and certainly not by marriages to foreign women accustomed to fertility cult religions. I mean, what did they expect? Okay, well, let's move on now to Malachi 2, 17 through 3, 5. You have tired the Lord out with your talk, but you ask, how have we tired him? By saying, the Lord Almighty thinks all evildoers are good, in fact, he likes them. Or by asking, where is the God who's supposed to be just? The Lord Almighty answers, I will send my messenger to prepare the way for me. Then the Lord you are looking for will suddenly come to his temple, a messenger you long to see will come and proclaim my covenant. But who will be able to endure the day when he comes? Who will be able to survive when he appears? He will be like strong soap, like a fire that refines metal. He will come to judge like one who refines and purifies silver. As a metal worker refines silver and gold, so the Lord's messenger will purify the priests so that they will be, bring to the Lord the right kind of offerings. Then the offerings with the Lord of Judah and Jerusalem bring I'm sorry, then the offerings which the people of Judah and Jerusalem bring to the Lord will be pleasing to him as they used to be in the past. The Lord Almighty says, I will appear among you to judge and I will testify at once against those who practice magic, against adulterers, against those who give false testimony, those who cheat employees out of their wages, those who take advantage of widows, orphans, and foreigners, against all who do not respect me. That's a pretty... So Pretty forceful statement, isn't it? Is that a, is that a prophecy mm -hmm. to, for Jesus? Well, it's, it's a, 
what we have here in Malachi is God, God saying, I'm not just going to send you blessings and send you blessings and send you blessings. This is what's going to happen if you don't obey me. This is what will happen if you do obey me. Right. Um, but that one where you were talking about Jesus or the, the person entering the temple mm -hmm. and that they didn't know about it, and all that, it seems to be a prophecy that came true. Well, yeah. Later, when Jesus entered the temple and the way they Yeah, because him. they didn't, the people didn't know who he was. They just thought he was a, a teacher, mm -hmm. you know, it was just a troublemaker or something that's overdone. Well, God immediately follows that with a very, maybe a perplexing verse. Look at Malachi 3, verse 6. I am the Lord, and of course that's the word for Yahweh, the, the personal name for God, and I do not change. And so you, the descendants of David, Jacob, are not yet completely lost. Is that really true, that God doesn't change? Well, it depends what you mean by that. Yeah. Another place where we need to understand biblical terms and biblical terminology, right? What about Genesis 6, 6, and 7? God was sorry he had ever made people and put them on the earth. He was so filled with regret that he said, I will wipe out these people I have created and also the animals and the birds because I'm sorry that I made any of them. But the Lord was pleased with Noah. Does that sound like God changed his mind? Uh, well, you're assuming that he was had every intention that it was going to be something that would make him happy. Well, look at 1 Samuel 15. 1 Samuel 15 is a, maybe the best chapter in the whole Bible to illustrate this point. Start with verse 10, 10 and 11. The Lord said to Samuel, I am sorry that I made Saul king. He has turned away from me and disobeyed my commands. Samuel was angry and all night long he pleaded with the Lord. Okay? God said he's What's, it, what's, what's his attitude about making Saul king? Sorry, I did it. Okay. Drop down to verse 29. Same chapter, right in the same chapter, verse 29. Israel's majestic God does not lie or change his mind. He is not a human being. He does not change his mind. Was he sorry that he made Saul king? Well, the question is, though, he might be sorry, but would he do it again? Well, but I mean, why did he tell Samuel to go and anoint this guy king? And now he says he's sorry that he made him his king. Isn't that a changing of your mind? Well, it might have been a purpose that he had in his foreknowledge, and he knew he was going to be sorry about it, but he knew he had to do it anyway to get to, for the whole big picture. Well, in case you missed it the first time, look at verse 35. Still the same chapter. Last verse, same chapter. As long as Samuel lived, he never again saw the king, but he grieved over him. The Lord was sorry that he had made Saul king of Israel. RSV says repented, which means change direction. Change whether his God mind. was whether it was repent your, means to change your right, mind. Right. So whether you're sorry, uh, I don't think if there was really any remorse there. I think it was God just said, You've learned it this way, now you're gonna see it from another point of view. Well both God and Samuel tried to talk them out of a king mm -hmm. several times. Mm -hmm. They refused to listen. Okay. So God finally gave them the king that they wanted, okay. a king to lead them. Do you think so, God was sorry that he had to give them a king or he felt like it was necessary well, sure. to give him a king right at the point where he appointed him king? Absolutely sorry. So God didn't change his mind. He was sorry from the day he appointed Saul king. I'm just a little bit wonder about the word sorry as changing a direction because I hear parents all the time telling their parent their children I'm sorry I've got to do this but you need to stay in your room mm -hmm. now if if you're sorry that you got to do it and you'd still do it anyway there's a purpose for why he's doing it yeah so um, I'm not quite sure if sorry actually means a change of direction well, the word is repented. If you well, go back. even repenting. 
Because it could be a change of direction, yes, yeah. That's but what. it could be a change of direction as far as but in I the read, front of things. I, I read you the verse that says, I am the majestic, majestic God of Israel, I do not change. Yeah. Or I'm God, he, I, I don't need to repent, he says. Yeah. And also, well, the Lord will not lie or repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of other places. Exodus 32, 14, 1 Samuel 2, 30, Numbers 23, 19, and 20, Judges 2, 18, 2 Samuel 24, 16, and I could go on. 1 Chronicles 21, 14, places in the Bible where it suggests that either God doesn't change his mind or he does change his mind, back and forth and back and forth. And the only reasonable way to deal with those things is to do what we've just done here. Look at the larger context. Think about what God has to deal with. He was sorry before he made Saul king because he knew what was going to happen. He knew very well what was going to happen. He never wanted Saul to be, but the people wanted a person like Saul to be king. And God says, okay, I thought you what you, what you really want and you're not going to change your mind. Here's your king. And they were so excited, oh, look at this wonderful king we have, da 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 da. And what, 40 years later, were they happy about it? Not a good thing at all. So I would say this is an important way to understand, an important principle in understanding biblical stories. You need to look <coughs> at the full context. What about that Genesis 6, 6 and 7 again? Was God sorry he made man? How does that fit with Genesis 131, which says, God looked at everything he had made and he was very pleased. Evening passed and morning came, that was the sixth day. How did he go from very pleased to, I'm sorry that I made man? Is that a change? Sure sounds like it, doesn't it? Did God know that the flood was coming when he created Adam and Eve? He did. He did. He understood that. So, it, why did he do that? Yeah. I, I, yeah. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not really trying to um, go against what you're saying. But if you take the change thing too far, then God would become a statue, mm -hmm. because if he moves from one place to the other, he's changed his position. So he's, you know, if he goes from from here to there. He's changed again. Well, so I don't know. Okay, let's look at no. the context. I, I take your point. Okay. Let's just look at the context. Do you think God was happy to see all those people, all his children die in the flood? No. No. Did he know it was going to happen? Yeah. I would say absolutely yes. He wasn't happy about it, but he knew that this is the only way he could, re can, he could maintain some kind of contact with the human race. He knew that if he had waited another generation or two, there would have been nobody paying any attention to him. And it was bad enough as it was. I mean, look what was happening with Ham and so forth within almost immediately after the flood. So what, is God, what are we learning from this? We're learning that God chooses to do these kinds of things because he believes that freedom is absolutely essential to our relationship with him. You can't have love without freedom, but freedom requires choice. And God has choice, and, and God created man in his image, and man has choice. He chooses to make us with choice, and he chooses to live with the consequences. Because God is love. Mm -hmm. Basically, he could only create intelligent creatures that have that capacity to mm -hmm. choose. Mm -hmm. So there's the, there's the dilemma that God is in, and we need to we need to remember that issue, that dilemma, every time we talk about God in the Bible and why he did this, why he did that. Well, there's another big issue coming up, chapter 3, 8 to 12. I asked you, is it right for a person to cheat God? Of course not, yet you are cheating me. How, you ask, in the matter of tithes and offerings? A curse is on all of you because the whole nation is cheating me. Bring the full amount of your tithes to the temple so there will be plenty of food there. Put me to the test and you will see. This is God challenging us to put him to the test. And you will see that I will open the windows of heaven and pour out on you the in abundance all kinds of good things. I will not let insects destroy your crops and let your, 
and your grape vines will be loaded with grapes. Then the people of all nations will call you happy because your land will be a good place to live in. What, uh, what's a tithe? Tithe isn't a very common word in our modern English. Well, tithe comes from an ancient, an old English term, teothe, or teagothe, which means one-tenth. The word is used to translate the Hebrew word maser, which means one-tenth. It, it usually is used to refer to the tenth portion of one's income, whether from crops or salary or any other source that is returned to God as an acknowledgement that all we have and are belong to him. Abraham had paid a tenth to the king priest Melchizedek. After God helped him rescue Lot and his associate, Jacob later promised to pay a tenth. And of course, through Moses, God told the children of Israel to do what? Set aside a tenth to support what tribe? Levites. The, the, the priest tribe, the Levites. Well, look at Malachi 3, 13 to 18. You have said terrible things about me, says the Lord, but you ask, what have we said about you? You have said it is useless to serve God. What's the use of doing what he wants or of trying to show you the Lord Almighty that we are sorry for what we have done? As we see it, proud people are the ones who are happy. Evil people are not only prosper, but they test God's patience with their evil deeds and get away with it. Then the people who feared the Lord spake to one another, and the Lord listened and heard what they said in his presence, there was written down in a book a record of those who feared the Lord and respected him. They will be my people, says the Lord Almighty, on the day when I, will, when I act. They will be my very own. I will be merciful to them as a father is merciful to the son who serves him. Once again, my people will see the difference between what happens to the righteous and to the wicked. Sorry, oh, you people over here. <laughs> to, the person, <laughs> to the person who serves me and the one who does not. So there's a time coming when God's judgment is going to be on the earth. And what about Malachi, Matthew 5, 48, where he says, you know, I let my sunshine fall on the righteous and on the evil one, you know? I, do we, are, we, are we happy that God blesses all of his children? Or do we feel uncomfortable with that? And what about this scroll that he's talking about there in Malachi 3.16? What's that? Ellen White makes a comment that helps us to understand that. She says, and this is from the book, um, let me get it here to the bottom of it. Signs of the Times, December 30, 1884. And there's, it's also in five, the volume five of the Bible Commentary, page uh, 13. I'm sorry, 1132. And I'm going to read just selections from that. That which alone can effectually restrain from sin in this world of darkness will prevent sin in heaven. The significance of the death of Christ will be seen by saints and angels. The angels suffering, uh, I'm sorry, the angels ascribe honor and glory to Christ, for even they are not secure except by looking to the sufferings of the Son of God. It is through the efficacy of the cross that the angels of heaven are guarded from apostasy. Without the cross, they would be no more secure against evil than were the angels before the fall of Satan. Angelic perfection failed in heaven. Human perfection failed in Eden, the paradise of bliss. All who wish for security in the earth or heaven must look to the Lamb of God. The plan of salvation, making manifest the justice and love of God, provides an eternal safeguard against defection in unfallen worlds, as well as among those who shall be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. So, uh, so what's that all about? What are we saying here? We're saying that there's a scroll, and God keeps a record of everything, and that record is very essential because what? It's going to be our eternal safeguard. If a billion years from now, if someone says, why do we have to do things God's way? Maybe God makes a bunch of new people on a new planet somewhere. And one of them says, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go my own way. I don't need to do it God's way. God would probably say, sit down over here for a moment. I have something that you need to see. Here's the record of what happened on planet Earth when someone tried this. Do you think that would be enough of a safeguard? I hope, I hope no one would be foolish enough to look at the history of the great controversy and ever want to rebel against God again. 
Well, in the last couple of minutes we have Malachi 4. Look at just a couple of verse, verse, the first two, three verses. The Lord Almighty says, The day is coming when all proud and evil people will be like straw. On that day they will burn up and there will be nothing left of them. Is that talking about an eternally burning hell? No. Straw is dead. And how much is left of it? Have you ever burned straw? You can, it, the tiniest little bit of powdery, I mean, there's virtually, and it's almost pure carbohydrate, and it just burns, there's virtually nothing left. So what's going to happen to the wicked? Will they be like straw? God says so. And there's a lot of other verses to support that. Um, Exodus 15, 17, Isaiah 5, 24, maybe one of the best ones is Isaiah 66, 24, but also Joel 2, 5, Obadiah 18, Nahum 1, 10, 2 Peter 2, 6, if we had time to read them. These verses should make it very clear that the final destiny of the wicked is nothingness. And there, uh, there's no such thing as an eternally burning hell unless, let's be honest, unless you consider God's glory as the true fires of hell. Remember that Ellen White says, Desire of Ages, page 108, at the top of the page, the light of the glory of God, which imparts life to the righteous, will slay the wicked. So the fires of hell, what, which destroy the wicked, are really what? Life-giving. The life-giving glory of God. And what is the Elijah message? Well, the Bible suggests, if you read over in Revelation 19.10, the people at the end of this verse history are going to be, another, be just like Elijah, be, just be like John the Baptist preparing the world for the second coming of Christ. And what is that Elijah message going to be? Turn the fathers to the children, the children to the fathers, and so forth. They will be a, a group that are inspired like the prophets, who believe in the prophets, who carry God's message to the world. So, what do you think? Would it be safer for God to save the wicked people from the Old Testament, or, or the Pharisees in New Testament times, or... What about the woman at the well who had many husbands? Think about the message of Malachi. What does it tell us that might be relevant to us in our day? I think there's a lot of truth for us, and we need to learn it. See you next week.